Hello, 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 everyone, and welcome back to Stein's Gate. We're back again. I am recording these back to back to back. I'm trying to get some progress in. So we're back again. We figured out how to do the phone wave stuff. Uh, we've upgraded the phone wave with the use of Mr. Braun's TV downstairs. Okabe got in trouble, uh, but we now know how to work the phone wave in an efficient way to put memories into the past. So yeah, in short, oh wait, that's Karisu. In short, this device converts memories to data and sends them to the past. Oh yeah, we're hearing a whole explanation of how the phone wave works again. <laughs> Let's begin with what we all know. By free coincidence, the phone wave is able to produce ring singularities, much like John Teeter's time machine. Through the ring singularity, we are able to send up to 36 bytes of data to the past. The signal can only be received by phones. While that does limit the range of effect, it also removes an element of uncertainty from the equation. Unlike D-mails, memory data is sent in the form of a phone call. So we will be using a phone number, not an email address, to set the destination. The ring singularity is made naked and stable by a device known as a lifter. In our case, that's the 42-inch CRT downstairs. She explained the basics. Next, she'll explain the modifications she made to turn the phone wave name subject to change into a leap machine. The phone wave now has headgear attached. <laughs> me on August 13th, 2010. <laughs> That's me <laughs> right now. <laughs> That's me whenever Okabe speaks. The headgear records... The headgear records the nerve impulses in the temporal lobe of the brain. Specifically, the CA3 region of the hippocampus where memories are stored. Hips list! Hippocampus CA3. The hippocampus is divided into three histo histological sections. CA1, CA2, and CA3. CA refers to the name given to the hippocampus by a uh, uh, anatomist Gerinigiot in <laughs> 1742. Cornu Aponis. The Horn of Amun. Amun? Amun. Then, using VR technology, we encode the nerve impulses into electrical signal data. It comes out at approximately 3.24 terabytes. 3.24 terabytes? It's less than expected. We're talking about the entirety of a person's memories. By the way, we'll set up so that the data decodes automatically after a certain amount of time. Anybody well versed in programming can do this. I had Hashida make the code. Anyway, next we send the memory data through the net to the LHC in France. Oh, is that the one in CERN? The building has a direct line to CERN for some reason, so we can transfer data at insanely high speeds. Okay. How long does it take to send 3.24 terabytes of data? We'll have 64 direct lines in parallel, so if we send in 64 parts, we should upload in about 45 seconds. Hey, that's not bad. That's less than a minute. That's pretty fast. Next, we hijack the LHC, create a mini black hole, and use that black hole's super gravity to compress the data into 36 bytes. You're making 3.24 terabytes into just bytes? 3 terabytes is about 3 trillion bytes. Compressing that into just 36 bytes. That's one hell of a squeeze. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. Will the compression take long? 
That's practically instantaneous. 23 milliseconds of thereabouts. We're using a black hole after all. By the way, the compression only holds in the immediate vicinity of the black hole. Once the data leaves that area, it will begin to decompress on its own. This too takes 23 milliseconds. It has to make it back to the X6800 and into the phone wave within that window. It's only 36 bytes. Shouldn't be a problem. Continue, Christina. While the data is being compressed, we use the phone wave to generate a curve ring singularity. When the electron discharge phenomenon occurs, we take the 36 byte data, touch it in, and send it to the past. Time leap, basically like D mail. This part is just like a D mail. The data travels to a specified time where it arrives at the recipient's phone. By now, 23 milliseconds show passed, so the data will be fully decompressed. Next, the decoding program runs, converting the data back into nerve impulse signals. These signals are discharged from the phone's earpiece at approximately 0.02 amp, -am a pretty weak charge. If the recipient has the phone to his ear, they should go straight into his brain. Whoa! That's scary! Assuming he answers his phone. If he doesn't, the transfer fails. Fortunately, we lose nothing but that copy of the memory data. Why a phone call instead of an email? They didn't have emails on their phones back then, did they? Because we need the recipient to put the phone to his ear. Otherwise, the signals won't reach his temporal lobe. Ah, it has to go into... okay. She indicates the side of her head. In this area, you have the frontal lobe and temporal lobe of the brain. As I explained before, the hippocampus where memories are stored is inside the temporal lobe. The phone sends out electrical impulses that pass through the temporal lobe and into the hippocampus, overriding the recipient's memories. At the same time, the phone sends impulses that stimulate the frontal lobe as well. This is important. Remember that the frontal lobe is responsible for sending retrieval signals to the temporal lobe. This is how you remember things. By stimulating the frontal lobe, we force it to send retrieval signals keyed to the new memory data. Thus, the recipient recalls all of those memories as if they were his own. Which, of course, they are, or will be in the future. This happens in less than a second. Now, the recipient has the same memories as the sender. The time leap is complete. If the data came from one week in the future, the recipient will remember that week as if he experienced it firsthand. Well, will it get confusing? Because then they'll have their old memories and the new ones and they'll be like, wait a second, what? <laughs> we need to be aware that consciousness and personality aren't transferred. Both of those depend on the recipient. Explain it with- uh, Shut up! Shut up, Daru! Shut up, Daru! Shut up! Karisu dissolves into blushing, stammering mess. Into a blushing, stammering mess. Looks up like it's up to me to answer Daru's question. Not with boobs, obviously. Not with the booba. Let's say we send your memories to you in grade school. 
Right now, you're some kind of omnisexual pervert who thinks in inanimate objects. Who thinks inanimate objects are hot? But in elementary school, you were still an innocent child. I was a boring little bastard who did nothing but study. What of it? Oh no, Daru! Basically, that little bastard would suddenly have all of your perverted memories. But his personality wouldn't change. It's not like you'll become that famous anime detective with the looks of a child and the brains of an adult. What? That sucks. It isn't like the time leaping you see in sci-fi novels. We aren't yet capable of transferring personality and consciousness. Um. Um. Since you need a phone to receive the signal, you can only send memories to the times you had one. We also need to make sure that the sender and the recipient are the same person. Ah, uh, you only affect your memories. If someone besides your past self, your parents or a friend for instance, answers the phone, then the nerve impulse signals will be projected into their brain instead. Also, you can give your memories to your friends or your family. If that happens, your memories could overwrite theirs, which could obviously cause serious damage to their psyche. Oh no, that's not good. Risu enter X. Oh, whoops. I, I didn't read that. Oh, I clicked too fast. The lab falls into silence. I exchange glances with Karisu and Daru. I look at my Yuri, but her expression is blank. I guess it was too complicated for her. Or maybe she knows a lot and she just doesn't want you to know she knows a lot. So. I clear my throat. It's time for the million dollar question. Are we going to do it? What do we do with it? Do with what? The phone wave! Or the time leap machine! The time leap machine, of course. What do we do with it? For once, my assistant has nothing to say. I already know that she fears we've created a monster. Honestly, I feel the same way. After a few moments, Karisu finally speaks. It's too much for us to handle, that's for sure. The safest thing would be to hand it over to the government for professional research. I can tell that she's not pleased to have reached this conclusion. She obviously would prefer to experiment with this technology. After all, it's humanity's first time machine. We've finally taken our first steps towards godhood! I'm sure that the nations of the world would pay billions for just one look at our machine. The possibilities that represents are limitless. It just doesn't feel real. Mayushi doesn't get it. That's cause you didn't work on it, Mayushi. Oh, right! <laughs> What about you, Okabe? And I mean you, not Hyonin Kyoma. I agree with Karisu that the time leap machine is dangerous, but I want to test it. On the other hand, I want to experiment. I state my honest feelings. Karisu gasps! But there are still questions we need to answer. This is unknown territory, not just for us, but for all of humanity. Who will time leap? Maybe you should, Okavan, you're already having the memory stuff. I look to each of the lab mems in turn. Daru quickly looks away. Mayuri's Yuri's expression is blank. Risu stares right back at me. It's hard to choose. I'll pass. It's between Okabe and Karisu. Not a single person here wants the honor of being history's first time traveler. 
Everyone except for Mayuri is probably thinking about what could go wrong. What if the time leap were to fail? Oh god. It's not like CERN's time machine. The possibility of becoming a Jellyman is zero. This machine sends data, not the real thing. Don't let your preconceptions influence your decision. You might say it's like a cut and paste of your brain. Actually, it's more like a copy paste, and it's just your memories. I think she's trying to influence Okabe. <laughs> the original doesn't get erased. That's a very easy to understand example. But that's not the problem. Time flows in a straight line from past to present to future. At least that's how most humans see it. This raises several questions. What if there's an error somewhere and the data itself gets fractalized? Fractalized? Let's say, I sent my memories an hour into the past. My memories would be replaced by fractalized data. In other words, data full of tiny holes. Couldn't that cause memory loss? I suppose. One hour later, we arrive once again at the present. At that time, the me who lost his memories an hour ago, and the current me conflict in my brain. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. Which data set survives? Logically, the present should change as soon as you send your memories to the past. The conflicting current me disappears then. So then it's not a copy-paste at all, is it? It's a copy-paste erase? I don't know. No one's ever experienced time travel before. When we send a Gmail, the world is reconstructed based on the change we made to the past. I'm the only one who's aware of this, however. We don't know what happens when you time leap. If it's the many worlds interpretation like Peter said, then the instant you would time leap, it creates two possibilities. One where you shift into another world line, and one where you travel back in time on the same world line. Of course, there must also be a world line where the current you doesn't disappear. That would likely correspond to the present that we are experiencing right now. I'm with my Yuri right now because my brain hurts. Yep. <laughs> I knew she was going to be like, what? I feel you, Ma my Yuri. I don't know. I don't know. But that's only if the many worlds interpretation holds in the first place. Just do it. Somebody do it. Just, just I can do it. I want to see something happen. <laughs> I thought you didn't believe what Teeter had to say. I'm talking hypothetically. Teeter doesn't matter right now. If it's the Copenhagen interpretation, then every possible state propagates through space as a wave function. When a particular state is observed, the remaining states collapse and that state is fixed. Okay, let's look at terms. Copenhagen. A well-known approach to the Schrodinger cat thought experiment. If this interpretation before the box is open, the cat exists as a combination of two wave functions. One that is alive and one that is dead. The instant the box is opened and the cat is observed, the wave function collapses to either condition. If the cat is alive upon opening the box, the wave function collapses to become a live cat. Conversely, if the cat is dead, the wave function collapses to become dead cat. Another quantum approach to this experiment is that the many worlds interpretation in this case, the observer who found the cat alive and the observer who found the cat dead exist in two separate universes that diverge the moment the box is opened. The Copenhagen interpretation is currently the dominant theory. Okay? Wave function. In quantum theory, a function representing a quantum state. Scientists are not sure if wave functions represent reality 
or our convenient mathematical abstraction to describe what goes on in quantum mechanics. Okay. <laughs> but precise observation is impossible. The problem is who the observer is in this case. Wouldn't it be a third party? Like me or Mayushi? Not necessarily. It might be me. It might be someone else. It could even be God. To begin with, the Copenhagen interpretation and the many worlds interpretation are both microscale theories used to explain quantum interactions. No one knows whether they can be applied to humans or the world at large. What about my personal experiences with reading Steiner? If reading Steiner is the sort of power I think it is, then the world line model is correct. In the end, we arrive at the question of where is the self? This time leap machine only sends memories. That I guarantee. Won't the present be reconstructed at the moment of transfer? That's what happens with Okarin's reading Steiner, right? That makes sense where D-mails are concerned. When we send a D-mail, we're obviously interfering in past events. But time leaping is different. All you do is send your memories to the past, which isn't the same thing as sending a targeted D-mail. Yeah, but it might change what you do. Whether the me who suddenly remembers one hour into the future will, in fact, change the past, is something we can't know until it happens. Well, it's the butterfly effect. As soon as you mess with the past, everything changes. I'm getting confused. It sounds like we're talking about the soul. Isn't that a religious question? Wait, you guys are misunderstanding something. I'm misunderstanding everything. <laughs> One hour isn't enough time for your personality to change. You should be the same person one hour ago that you are now. The only difference is that you'll have an extra hour's worth of memories. How can you be sure? Well, I can't. Nobody's tried it before. Maybe we should try it right now. Hey, we should try it. This discussion's going nowhere. Yeah, you should just do it. Personality and consciousness can't be strictly defined, so it's hard to imagine what might happen. Sorry, I punched my cherry sours. <laughs> I have a bag of cherry sours in front of me. I accidentally punched him. So, which is it? We don't know. We can argue the theories all we want, but in the end, we can only guess. Do it! Do it! Do it! Do it! This experiment may end up shattering preconceptions scientists and philosophers have held for centuries. Do it! Do it! We won't know until we try. This pretty much sums it up. Do it! <laughs> to make matters worse, the subject must be prepared to risk damage to their psyche. Kurisu, Daru, and I say no more. We can't solve this problem. This is our limit as scientists. But we haven't accomplished enough already? The time leap machine itself is worthy of a Nobel Prize. We could sell this technology for billions if we so choose. And if we go public with the time leap machine, we can break CERN's monopoly on time travel technology. That's enough. It has to be. No, no. Hey! Mayuri, who has been observing the discussion with glassy eyes, opens her mouth to speak. Um, I have an idea. Why don't we make a bana b banana <laughs> a banana time leap instead? Oh my Yuri. Bananas don't have brains like people do. Oh, 
Do you need a brain, huh? My Yuri never changes. The atmosphere in the room gets a little more relaxed. Let's not experiment. No, I wanted to see you go and do the experiment. <laughs> we'll entrust the time leap machine to a suitable research institution. Then we'll announce it to the world. But, but, thanks to the lightning of the mood, I can finally say what was on my mind. Neither Karisu no, nor Daru objects. Okay. No one has touched the time leap machine since that decision. Or discussion. Ridiculous as it sounds, I can't shake the feeling that it might suck my memories out and fling them into the past. Oh, the machine does have its appeal, of course. We're all tempted by the idea of becoming humanity's first time leapers. Yet the fear of what could happen won out in the end. Perhaps as a way to forget our fears and move on, we decide to hold a celebration to mark the completion of the device. We're gonna have a celebration? Everyone feels the need to let loose after working so hard on the project. <gasps> I have Daru order pizza while Karisu and I go shopping for snacks. <gasps> We're going shopping with Karisu? Yay! Akiba has always had a lack of supermarkets. That hasn't changed even with the anime stores gone. After we finish shopping, Karisu and I walk along evening streets. Hi, Karisu! She looks like she's got something to say. What do you want to say, Karisu? She keeps stealing glances at me. Are you upset? <laughs> upset? She frowns like she didn't expect that question. Finally, she faces this way. About our decision not to attempt a time leap experiment. No, I'm not upset. Humans are temporal beings. That's a head. Hi, Degger quote. I was actually relieved when you made the decision not to use the machine. If you hadn't been there, I might not have been able to stop myself. Thank you. What's this? Gratitude? Does she have a fever? I put my hand to her forehead to check. Karisu twitches. Uh, what are you doing? You're talking like an assistant for a change. I thought you might have a fever. I dropped my hand. She's pissed now. <laughs> I'm not grateful to you or anything, okay? Her voice is louder than it should be, and several people glance at us. Crazy blushes and hangs her head. If Daru were here, he'd probably get all excited and say, A real tsundere! Sweet! Anyway... Karisu clears her throat and returns to her usual sour expression. That thank you is just a formality. Don't get me wrong, okay? Of course. I only did what I had to. I am the founder of the future gadget lab, Yonin Kyoma. My first priority is to protect the welfare of my lab members. So I have no need for your thanks. And yet you always talk about plunging the world into chaos. You are my allies, and the world is my enemy. I'm speechless. You're too self-righteous. You say speechless, yet you're speaking? Don't argue semantics. It's quite mysterious, really. It's only been two weeks since Karisu and I have met- TWO WEEKS! And yet it already feels natural for us to be walking together, exchanging banter like this. Perhaps pooling our efforts to create something new dangerous- New dangerous though it may be, has brought us closer together. I mean, I guess if I was playing through this consistently, maybe it'd feel like two weeks, but for me it feels like... Uh... 
Three, four years? <laughs> Maybe longer? I admit that her knowledge and skills are impressive. I got mail. Oh, don't forget what Teeter said. Huh? Thank you, Suzuha. I'd like to. I'd like her to re remain at the lab if I, at all if possible, but she says she's going back to America this month. It's already the 13th, so I wonder when she plans to return. Hopefully not tomorrow. I decide to ask her. Oh yeah, I forgot to get a plane ticket. <gasps> I gotta catch up on improving the phone wave. Going public with the time late machine will send the world into an uproar. We also plan to expose CERN, remember? We may not be able to go back to America for some time. I guess you're right. I should call Mama and let her know. Looks like things are going to get busy. Naturally, I want Carissa to stay with us to the end. <gasps> so she's gonna stay? A little bit after we return to the lab, Mayuri gets back. Mayuri! Doo -doo -doo. I'm back! Seems like Mayuri went to Lukako's. Suzuha shows up a few minutes later and our development council comes to order. Development Council, what Okarin calls a party. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, translation. Daru ordered three pizzas. We also line up all the snacks we bought on the table. It's just like the party we had a few days ago to cheer up Suzuha. Mayuri wanted to decorate the room, but since everyone's tired, I dismissed it as unnecessary. Looks like Suzuha managed to retrieve her jacket from Mr. Pond. Yeah. Man, that was terrible! I was stuck- Oh! My finger slipped. She was stuck looking like something the whole day. <laughs> the brawn tube workshop closed. Or the brawn tube work- What? The brawn tube workshops closed. Suzuha made sure the 42-inch CRT was turned off, so there's no need to fear any malfunction from the time leap machine. A heavy sigh escapes my throat. I realize I've always been tense and nervous since the time leap machine was completed. Now I can finally relax. Unless somebody messes with it. What if somebody messes with it? You don't know. The topic of the time leap machine has become taboo. Even Karisu doesn't bring it up during the meeting. Meeting. Daru, why did you order the exact same pizza as before? I opened the pizza boxes to find the exact same ones he got for Suzuha's party. Because I like it. Naturally, I'm not amused. Okarin! Okarin! I called Ferris-chan and Luka-chan, but they said they couldn't come. Oh. Oh. Do they have plans? Here's Sean has Rhinet tournament. Oh. Crap! I should have gone to cheer! How careless of me! And Luca chan seemed embarrassed for some reason. I wonder why! Oh, Karen! Maybe she thinks she'll make her wear a costume again. You still haven't convinced her to cosplay? Then what was the point of completing that costume? You said it was embarrassing. I kept telling her cuteness is justice, but she never listens. Cuteness is justice. Is that what they say? You're cute too, Christian. Oh. Eh? Huh? Eh? Huh? doesn't know how to react. She blushes and Ma Mayuri starts teasing her like a drunk old man. There's no alcohol at this party, of course. Nah, nah. Hey, Kamima's coming up. Wanna go? I can't make something new, but I have a costume of post-awakening Syrah from Blood Tune I made last year. 
I think the size is just right for Christian too. Oh, Christina can have a... a Christina, I'm trying to talk about Karisu can have an outfit. Me? Cosplay? Karisu looks conflicted, then she murmurs. I'm sort of interested. <gasps> she sure could have fooled us before, pretending to have no interest in otaku culture. But I refuse to do it in public, though. You don't have to show anyone, but eventually you'll want them to see. The cosplay demon compels you. The cosplay demon compels you. The cosplay demon? That reminds me. Christian, you're always wearing that cute uniform. What schools are from? Oh, this? Kurisu lifts up her necktie. I attended Ayamane for about two weeks. I modeled this outfit after their u uniform. Huh? Ayamane Women's Academy, a private school for girls in the Kudan Shita neighborhood of Tokyo. An academic powerhouse. Ayamane is a popular destination for foreign exchange students. Eh? Huh? Oh, their uniform is really cute, but you made it even cuter. You must have a really good design sense. Maybe Karisu and Mayuri can make costumes together. I'll bring the costume tomorrow, okay? Will you try it on then? Yes! Sure. Yes! Looks like Grisu approves of the cuteness is justice philosophy. When's the photo shoot? Daru, get out! Good to know you're still a pervert, Hashida. Come on! It's a Bloodtoon Sa Seira! She's got a Pan Moro going on! What's that? Pan Moro? It means her panties are completely exposed! Uh-oh. No way! It's okay. You might not know this, but last year there was a really popular saying. A really popular saying? They're not panties, so it's not embarrassing. Plenty embarrassing. Trust me. Wear it, okay? It's a promise. Maybe you shouldn't bother. Suzuha. Suzuha speaks her tone sharp. She's scowling at Karisu again. Suddenly, the atmosphere in the room changes. Oh, God. You're asking for trouble by trusting Makize Karisu. What's that supposed to mean? Naturally, my strong-willed assistant isn't one to back down from a fight. Sparks fly between the two girls. I've been meaning to ask, did I do something to you? Not to me, but I know everything you have done. What do you mean? I've done nothing to be guilty of. Perhaps. But I know your true nature. Whoa. Well, I think with that I'm gonna end this episode here. It's gotten pretty interesting. I <laughs> I think Suzu Hai and um, Karisu are about to fight. But we'll see in the next episode. So thank you guys so much for watching. If you want to, you can like, comment, subscribe, do whatever you want. And I will see you in the next episode of Stein's Gate. Bye!